Okay, I want to welcome everyone that's here in person and those of you on Zoom. And Janelle, it is so good to see you or hear you. We hope you're doing better. Thank you. Okay. And we, I want to thank Cynthia for helping me with the snacks this morning. Y'all enjoy it. And shall we pray before Deanna begins? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to meet with dear friends to study your word. Please be with Deanna as she guides us through the lesson she's prepared. Please bless each one of us here today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would silence your phones. All right, good morning. Welcome, everyone. Um, and we are back in our series, At the Table with Jesus. We are in Lesson 6, which is Sabbath at a Pharisee's house. And we'll be in Luke um, th the end of Luke 13 and the beginning of Luke 14 today. So um, before we get into all of that, let's think about our lesson from last week. Last week, Jesus was at the home of <laughs> at yet another Pharisee, um, and they got uh, into it about hand washing. So what stood out to you about last week's lesson? What what um, points have resonated? They were more interested in ritual than they were in their guests. Okay. More interested in ritual than kind of what what was so the ritual in question was the hand washing, the hand washing right? Not a hygienic um, thing element, but a, um, a, a religious practice, right? What was it supposed to do? What was the point of the religious ritual? Okay, cleansing, like physically you're washing off your hands, but it was uh, to help you in a spiritual cleansing, right? Prepare you for the presence of God was how all of the um, the cleanness, uh, purity rituals of the Old Testament of Leviticus were structured. And he said, you're supposed to be using these for inner reasons. And you guys are just focused on the outer. So what would be the point of that? Right? So yeah, that, that focus on outer observance. Um, and we can relate to that, can't we? Because anyone who uses outer observance for inner reasons can fall into the trap focusing on the inner observance. I'm going to see what maybe there. Um, okay, what else? What else stood out to you? Woes. Woes, yeah. We saw Jesus give six woes. You know, he was kind of hard on those Pharisees and those teachers of the law, right? Because he said that they were hurting people. He said, you're like a trap. You're like a, an unmarked grave. It means that you're like something as um, a feature that causes someone to be far from God when they think they're close to God. You're, you're misleading. It's like setting a trap. And so he was very um, corrective of those Pharisees and teachers of the law. It was woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. We talked about what, how, do we, how are we supposed to take those woes? Ourselves. Yeah, we can hear those, can't we? You know, the every woe can be a call to turn around and go the other way. You don't have to focus on external observance. And when someone says you're focused on the externals, you're focused on honor from men, there's an opportunity to turn back to Jesus and change our focus. And so I think, you know, that sense of every woe being an opportunity to turn around um, and receive a blessing. Yeah, what else? If the disciples asked for a prayer, we get the Lord's Prayer. Okay, so they asked, they said, well, teach us to pray like John's disciples did. They wanted a prayer that was for their group. Um, and Jesus not only taught them to pray, but taught them things about prayer, like God loves to give his children good gifts. And so we saw that even those teachings of woes are an offering of a good gift for us. Okay, anything else from last week? The parables were teaching perseverance. Okay. You have to 
Parables teaching a perseverance, persistence in prayer. Yes, because God is good. He's better than your friend who's already gone to bed, right? He wants to give you something. Keep asking. Carrie, what were you going to say? Yeah, we talked about that, how Jesus says, the reason I came, this was part of his purpose. Satan is like a strong man who is well armed, but someone stronger, Jesus comes and overpowers him. And so we know that that, that blessing of the victory of Jesus over evil is, was his part of his purpose and is, is there for us as well. Chris. I was going to mention something. In chapter 12, we didn't get to, which was that he talks of another feast where people come in and it's the host who feeds them, who feeds the guests. Okay, so um, Chris says, you know, there's, there's all this material in chapter uh, you said chapter 12, yeah. um, where there are parables which contain, I'm not sure which one are you talking about? Um, I think that, well, the par the banquet parables I know of are in today's lesson. We have a lot of banquet. We're like at a banquet telling banquet parables, right? But that, you know, that some of those themes run all the way through. Like, doesn't God provide food for the sparrow? Won't he provide food for you? And so there are these elements of the table that come through Jesus's teaching in these sections that we didn't discuss in class. Yeah. Did you find something you want to highlight, Chris? I'm looking for that one particular. Okay. Well, let's let's go. We'll we will co we'll cover several banquet parables today. So let's go on um, to today's passages. Um, will someone please read Luke thirteen twenty two through thirty? Loud, nice and loud. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then he will say, we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last, those who are last will be first and first who will be last. Thank you. Okay, so um, where is Jesus here? Verse 22. Well, he's on his way to Jerusalem. Okay, still on his way to Jerusalem. And so we see Luke continues to emphasize that the, the, his, the important thing about Jesus' location is his purpose, his journey towards Jerusalem, right? And why does someone seem, okay, so someone comes up and asks him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Why do you think they're asking that? Testing him. Okay, maybe if there's a test involved, I think I can I can see that. Yeah, what else? I mean, we don't know. I, we can't figure this one out necessarily, but I think it's useful to come up with a few options. They're concerned about themselves. They could be concerned about themselves. You know, they could be thinking, I hope the standards are low or else I'm never getting in. <laughs> right? Don't we feel that way sometimes? We think, gosh. It's a good thing God accepts sinners because, wow, I really messed that one up. And we all have those times. Yeah. What else might they be thinking? Hasn't Jesus in his teachings here talked about the kingdom a lot? He's talked about the kingdom a lot. So who is going to be able to be in the kingdom yeah. is a natural question. Isn't this a question that we ask 
even now, like this is sometimes the question of the day. Who is going to be saved? How many, right? How many? Is it only a few? That's a natural question. What else reason could there be? been writing the Pharisees all along, so they're probably wondering if they're going to make it or not. Right, he says, so he's taking down the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and they're like the best of us, right? And so it's like, wow, if they're not going to be saved, who is even left, right? This happens, this uh, exact conversation happens later in Luke 18, 23 um, through 26, but when the rich young ruler had heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. <laughs> well, what a hardship for you, right? <laughs> and Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And remember, they really thought heavily in terms of wealth being a sign of God's approval, right? And but Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They who heard it said, who then could be saved, right? But he said, things that are impossible with people are possible with God. And so there is a sense that if the best of us are struggling, what about the rest of us? Yeah. So, you know, and <laughs> this person could have been thinking, I'm the best of us. What about these riffraff around me? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of options here. And yet we sort of relate to even the ones that are opposites of one another, right? This is a natural question. Are only a few going to be saved? What does Jesus answer? Keep your eye on the narrow door. Okay, keep your eye on the narrow door. What else do y'all have? What translation do you have? Make every effort to enter. Yeah. Make every yeah. effort to enter. Okay. Strive to enter. Strive to enter. Okay. So there is, so did Jesus answer our, the question? Not yes or no. Not <laughs> yes or no, certainly. Just keep trying. Work on it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this feels familiar. Remember when someone said, who is my neighbor? And Jesus came back at it with, okay, who was a neighbor? Who, who did the work to be a neighbor? He didn't answer the question. He flipped it. And I think we're seeing the same sort of response here where Jesus does not say whether only a few or many will be saved. He says, do what you need to do to enter the kingdom of God. It's so important here, right? I think um, a lot of this, though, well, that kind of... Go ahead, Sharon, right. and then, um, Lori. You, you want to make sure you're doing, you want to make sure what you're doing is the right thing to do to get there. Does yeah, that make sense? yeah, you don't want to do it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that was another thought this guy was asking, who's going to be there? Am I doing it the right way? Well, apparently not. <laughs> well, well, some I'm are and some aren't, right, right? Right, right, But what I'm saying is as much as Jesus was getting on to the Pharisees, obviously they were doing something wrong or he would not have so many woes for them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Marie, you go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so, um, yeah, so there's this, there's a sense of, am I doing it the right way? And Jesus turns the question around, but he says, make every enter to in effort to enter through the narrow, narrow door. door. Why is it a narrow door? Straight and narrow way. The okay. wide path is full of danger. Okay, the math, the Matthew <laughs> yeah. version yeah. talks about the broad path yeah. and the narrow path. Yeah, so it's we we are familiar with this language, the narrow door. What's it mean that it's narrow? Not everybody's gonna get in. He says some will try and will not. You can actually miss it. You can miss the narrow door, mm -hmm. right? It's narrow, I would say, because it's it isn't just any way, right? It is a specific target. What is the specific target? Jesus. Jesus, 
right? Jesus says, here I am. And, and John, he says, I am the door for the sheep, right? He, he presents himself as the narrow door, right? Um, but that idea that you can miss it and the way of Jesus is the way to make every effort to enter it. And this way that the Pharisees and teachers of the law are pursuing, which is why he had so many woes for them, as you say, you know, was not the way to do it. And so, um, you know, there's a, there's a, a specific target and there's also an end date, isn't there? What does Jesus say that tells us there's an end date to your ability to enter the narrow door? The host is going to close the door and... The host is going to close... Why, why why can't we just leave the door open? Why isn't the door open forever? Why are we talking about the host closing the door? Isn't that a little mean? What do y'all think? Okay, they never let him in. That relationship, when there was the opportunity to build the relationship, it wasn't built. They said, but we were in the city where you taught. Is that sufficient? No. Jesus has spoken over and over again about the priorities, right? It's the cost of following Jesus. It has to be at the the center of your being you can't just be around while things are happening right these people say but 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 we we ate and drank with you you taught in our streets that's not enough for the priority that jesus has been describing that's not making that choice, is it? You know, this is the message. This has always been the message of the prophets all the way through the history of scripture, right? Is that there is a day of the Lord coming, right? The prophets always talk about the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is kind of a weird concept to us because we can't figure out what, which day they're talking about. And a lot of times the answer is they're talking about all of them. There's a day coming when those taking you away from exile will arrive. There's a day coming when the, um, the famine will hit. There's a day coming when Jesus is standing right in front of you saying, come to me. And if you're busy looking for honor for men or doing your external observance, maybe you're going to miss it. There's a day coming when Jesus comes back and the door closes. And so that day of the Lord concept is present here and that if every woe is an invitation to turn around and experience the blessing, there's still the message that it, the opportunity is here. It doesn't last forever, right? And so as, as loving and compassionate as Jesus is, that truth is part of his message of compassion. Come now. Now is your opportunity. Right. It doesn't happen by osmosis. They have to believe. It does not happen by osmosis. There is a commitment to going through that narrow door that's required. You can't just say, but you taught in our streets. You know, it's, that's not enough. Right. We notice that um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets are inside. And who are the, verse uh, 28, who are the you yourselves are, that are thrown out? Who is he talking to? Is he talking to the Pharisees? We wonder if he's talking to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, right? Because they're the ones that honored the prophets while they continued the same behavior that led them to kill the prophets right. and will lead them to kill the great prophet, right? So we, he can be talking to them. Who else? Any of the non-believers? Anyone who's on the side of not repenting, right? He says, it's not the healthy that need the doctor, but the sick, right? We've talked about this dichotomy over and over. If you're too healthy to come to Jesus, then... You didn't come to Jesus, right? The problem with that is that you didn't you didn't get what you actually needed because you were thought you were too healthy to come. And so this is anyone on that side of 
those things. So if you're too rich to come to Jesus, if you're too well fed to allow Jesus to satisfy you, that choice puts you on the, you yourselves have missed it. Okay. So this is kind of a, um, a severe teaching, isn't it? Um, and, but it parallels our teaching in the uh, table story today. And so keep this teaching in your in your mind because it's meant to be in um, the kind of put alongside these other teachings that we're going to get to. Okay, questions or comments before we go on? Linda. I think these are notes I took in a sermon at one time. Okay. That 13 1 down to 22 is about choices. Jesus is talking about choices that you have to make. So this warning about the narrow door is kind of a summarization of if you don't make these choices, mm -hmm. this is going to be the outcome. Yeah. And really not, yes, 13.1, you know, we have that sense of, but you yourself repent that happens in, in that first section. Mm -hmm. But more than that, like, hasn't that been the theme from the beginning? Yes. Right? This is the thematic, um, this thematic element is very consistent, isn't it? Like it shows up over and over. We yeah. definitely see it. Yeah. Okay. So um, we see who does take their place at the feast in the kingdom of God. Those who are last, those who are not those other things, those who accept, come, come to accept Jesus. Okay. Those who are last, those who are not the, you know, the well-fed, the rich. And then also he says in verse 29, what's that? Who comes? Okay. East, west, north, and south. Who is that? That's everyone. You know, that's a way to talk about the nations, right? Not just Jews, but the nations. And so sometimes I think we, we think of like, well, Jesus came and taught, um, but it was only for the Jews. And then later the, in Acts, it spreads to the Gentiles. Well, yes and no, right? Because here, even in Jesus's teaching over and over, we have, you know, the centurion lifted up as an example of faith. We have the east, west, north, and south coming. And so we have that message all the way through um, the gospel as well as through Acts, right? And so... Um, let me just draw kind of a parallel. Remember, he, he spoke against the towns of Galilee that wouldn't welcome Jesus' disciples. There we have a day of the Lord coming. The key towns of like Capernaum and Bethsaida and Chorazin, they have a day of the Lord coming. But the Gentile towns will rise up and speak against them right and then he talks about the people of Nineveh will rise up and speak again so this is a consistent theme go ahead Sandy I was just going to say this kind of brings in where he's inclusive and we've talked about how inclusive he is of people coming to him okay we have talked about Jesus being inclusive and when we get to the table passage I want to ask you if he's still being inclusive so keep that in mind um, as we go excellent point okay mm -hmm. someone read 31 through 35 for us at that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, thank you. Okay, very prophetic. Why is it prophetic? He's, he's predicting what's about to happen to him in Jerusalem. Okay, there's a there's a, a speaking into the events in Jerusalem. Yeah, how so? 
Well, because he said in three days, and then he said no one can die outside of Jerusalem. He okay. He knows he's going to die in Jerusalem. This is the, the that same thing which he's talking about the, you killing all the prophets, and now here here is the great prophet. No prophet can die outside Jerusalem. He is speaking of himself. And then, what about the three days? What's going on with that? Well, I think that's like the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of the crucifixion. I think he's referring to me. That's what I understood that that. It's relating. Okay. So he's talking about, you know, we know that the three days of the crucifixion to the resurrection is a relevant period of three days. You know, we got the in Luke somewhat muted sign of Jonah, right? Three days buried and then returned to life again, you know, that's spelled out for us in some of the other gospels, but we have to figure it out ourselves in Luke, right? So that three days is a factor, but he is, and so he's using that as kind of a, a, a way to talk about his journey. Is his journey, like his travel plans, are they literally three days? It'll take him when it takes him. Right, but he's talking about um, a three-day kind of pattern where there are elements of his ministry that he's going to complete until the third day that changes everything, right? This is a, this is a, a reference to a kind of pattern rather than a literal three days. It, you know, those three days in, on the, in the tomb, you know, being the literal part of it. Go ahead, Sandy. I was just going to ask, what is this, the third day I shall be perfected? Oh, I shall be perfected is what you have? Okay, so uh, we're, we're talking, um, KJV has I shall be perfected, and NIV has I shall reach my goal. I might pull up the NASB um, for a moment, but I suspect this is the word in Greek, that means completed, finished, matured, right? So it's like a thing that gets done, but it's also being perfected. It can be translated either way. That's my guess. Um, Makes sense. And I'll just, why don't we just look that up right quick? Mine says finish my course. Finish my course. Okay. What, what translation is that? That's okay. That's all right. Um, reach my goal. Yeah. Um, an end, an end point. It's a word for um, the, uh, sometimes academics use the word telos, um, meaning the, the end of a matter, like the um, goal or um, aim of a matter. Um, otherwise, we don't have a cognate in English unless you, you know, have an academic <laughs> vocabulary, which we don't always with but yeah it's that word yeah for an end an, an end he's going to reach his more like a completion goal and aim um yeah it's not the word for mature that i was thinking of it's the word for an end go I ahead i was just thinking about the completion thing that's one of the statements that he made on the cross it is completed. it's finished yeah yeah it is finished yeah Okay, yeah, a finishing, a perfection. These are these are similar concepts. Chris. I'm looking at it. He's still on the road. And it could be that he's, he knows it's going to take him a couple days still to get to Jerusalem, which is his aim. Yes. Right yeah. And then things really get interesting. Although he, he manages to make things interesting along the way, too. Yeah, because he's busy pronouncing, you know, more controversial, controversial teachings, right? Right? Okay. So um, let's go ahead and let's see, where are we? Um, let's get to our table passage. Oh, well, uh, you know, first let's talk about Jesus' lament over Jerusalem. Um, what, do you, what do you notice about that? It sounds like he's saddened. Do you hear emotion coming through this? Yeah. What else? He makes a comparison of drawing how the hen draws her children and that doesn't happen. 
the mother hen, right? He says, I have longed to gather you like a mother hen, you know, and we do, we have, sometimes we miss that we have images of God and Jesus that are feminine images, that are images of a woman, right? And here he says, I'm like that, right? There's a sense of compassion about drawing those hens for, what, why would you draw hens under your wings? What's that for? Protection. Yes, he would like to protect Jerusalem. And yet he speaks of them in terms of their historical disobedience. What does he say? They have killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you. Right, and so Jesus has this same, it's two things at once, right? Isn't it both? Isn't it, um, he's, he's mourning over the disobedience of Jerusalem at the same time as he is longing to protect the children of Jerusalem, right? And so we have like, you know, we see the same issue of the same pattern of rebuke that is paired with real compassion. Other questions or comments? Well, and, and so when I, when I hear it, it says that he wanted to gather the, you know, his children like the hen and the chick, but, to, but you were not willing. But you were not I mean, willing. I know as a parent, when you're trying to parent your child to go in the right direction and they're not really, I know how sad that makes me feel or disappointed and I can just. Why? Why does it bother you? Because you want the, the, you want the best for your kids. You want the best for them, right? And so this is that, you know, as we're thinking about those who don't get in the narrow door, is someone mean for closing it or is there like this, like, I wanted you to have what the good gift, but if you're not willing to accept the good gift, then what is left? And Jesus always, you know, you never see Jesus run, like force anybody to come to him, right? It never happens that Jesus forces. The invitation is there. The compassion is there. The sorrow is there, but you have to choose, right? As we've been talking about, Anne. Well, I was just reminded, you know, where he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that beginning. Made me think of David and Goliath. Yeah. Where he says, you know, he had found out that Absalom had died, you know, that he, he was, he wanted, he didn't want to, have, to be dead. You know, he wanted him to live, but he was his adversary at the same time. Absalom chose to be David's adversary, but David never chose to be Absalom's adversary. I think that's a, a, a very good parallel for some of these stories. Yeah. Sandy. And it's almost like he's trying to protect those that are inside from those that have chosen not to. Yeah. They could be a bad influence. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Okay, so with all of that, we'll continue on to our table passage. Um, 14, 1 through 24 all seem to be part of a one long section that is happening in the context of this meal, but we're going to divide it up to, to, so that we can make our way through it. So will someone read, please, um, 14, 1 through 11. And it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering spoke unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace. And he took him and healed him and let him go. And he answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an answer an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again for these things. How far? Yeah. Eleven. And he put forth a parable to those which are bidden, when he marked how they chose out the chief room, saying unto them, When you are bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man that thou be bidden of him. And he that bade, bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and you begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when you are bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that uh, bade thee comes, he may say unto you, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For 
whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humble, humbled himself shall be exalted. Thank you. Okay, so what day is it? It's the Sabbath day, okay? What significance does that have? Okay, not supposed to be working. Now, whether they should be healing is a debatable subject, right? Um, I had, I, I really thought I had a source that was saying that the Pharisees believed you could heal on the Sabbath if the life was in danger and otherwise not, but I cannot find that source. So I don't even know if I'm telling you something tr correct or not. Um, but the Pharisee tradition allowed for deeds of mercy to be performed on the Sabbath. And yet, what, what has, how has Jesus's Sabbath interaction with the people been? Again, it's kind of a test. They're... They seem to be testing him. Yeah, yeah. What's happened in the past on the Sabbath? They ate grain. They ate grain, okay. It was on the Sabbath that they were walking through the field, picking heads of grain and eating it, and they were criticized for it. But Jesus told a story about David mm -hmm. and then said... The son of man is Lord of the Sabbath, right? So there's that is kind of in the background of Luke's story. What else? He also healed. Uh, wasn't that pretty much at the same time he healed a man who Hand yes yeah and it's it's the next verse but it says on another sabbath a man with a withered hand was there jesus heals him and he asks at that time and you know we're like really because he asked it here it's it's very it's a very similar question he asks is it lawful to do good on or or do harm on the sabbath to save life or destroy it and that is the question that he puts to them Okay, and then what else? Y'all can cheat. I, I have. Well, I didn't have an actually asked them that if their animal fell in a ditch or something. Okay, that's here. Wouldn't you go pull your you ox out of a out. ditch? Right. You're going to wait and let it die, and then there you go. And then it's common sense that they wouldn't do that, right? Right? Yeah, here is that. And then there's one more passage in, in chapter 13, um, which I pointed you back to in your discussion questions, where this woman with a bent spine, he said, should not this yes. daughter of Abraham, whom Satan yes. has kept bound for 18 long yes. years, we can hear his compassion, can't we, uh, be set free on the Sabbath? From what bound her? Okay, so Jesus has butted heads with the religious leaders over the Sabbath over and over, right? What do the religious leaders think is important about the Sabbath? What, if you were to sum up their opinion of what matters on the Sabbath, about the Sabbath, what would you come up with? Okay, it's a day, well, of rest. Yes, it's important to rest. What else? rule they yeah. they turned it into a um like a test of how how faithful or how religious you are okay so there's two things in there right one of them is it's it's a rule and so they one thing that's important to them about the sabbath is obedience to god now does obedience matter to god yeah. Yeah. yes yes Yes. And so, yes, that's okay. But then uh, in addition to that, the other layer that's on top of it is uh, the, whoa, you know, number one to the Pharisees, you, you tithe meticulously, but you lack justice, right? And so he says, you have used it as a way to display your obedience to uh one well, number two gain honor from men right and so that seems to be what is important is like they want the obedience but they also want the obedience on display we want to know and remember we we have more understanding of them when they re we remember that they were trying to do what the law said which is if you obey me then 
God said, if you obey me, I'll take care of you. And they said, well, we haven't obeyed and we're suffering for it. Let's get our obedience really in order so that we can return to something like the glory days of David and Solomon, right? That's what they're trying to do. And it's understandable when we view it in those terms, right? But that was what was important to them about the Sabbath. What's important to Jesus? How does Jesus view the Sabbath? Chris. He, he says they've missed the point, basically, because they're looking, as we read earlier, at the externals, not the internal. It should it should be a day of praising God for everything that He's done, and not and not just not doing anything. Okay, so Jesus says they have missed the point. They should have been praising God, right? This woman praised God. Is that, wait, where is this? Um, yes, um, 13, 13. Then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God, right? So there should be a connection with God, with the owner of the house who wants to know you right? There should be a, a, a praising of God that would happen in the Sabbath. What else is in the Sabbath? If you have the opportunity to do good on the Sabbath, just as you would any other day, you should, should do that. God wants good things for his children. If you have the opportunity to do good, wouldn't you do it? Jesus says that's not just allowable on the Sabbath. That is the point of the Sabbath, right? Is the goodness a time to be, to dwell in the goodness of God. Rest, a day of rest is a day to rest in the goodness of God. He says saving someone from illness, from a uh, withered hand, from um this dropsy is a um, edema that would come from something more serious, usually something like, you know, congestive heart failure results in edema. That's what the edema is what the dropsy is. You know, you save someone, that is the essence of the goodness of the good life with God, right? Living God's way, a truly good life of rest, restoration and wholeness, victories over evil, that's the point of the Sabbath, right? When you reduce it to a display of obedience, you're missing that it's supposed to be a way to lead us into the good life. Go ahead, Sandy. Well, I was just going to ask you, these things that you're supposed to be obeying, are they man-made laws? Um, okay, so Sandy says, are the things we're supposed to, they're, that he, they were expecting Jesus to obey, man-made laws okay they were a combination so there was the law which um god gave and it did say to rest on the sabbath and it gave some examples of things that you would do and not do on the sabbath and then the pharisees were the champions of what was called the oral tradition which was they called a fence around the law so it was all of these extra rules that helped you make sure that you really did obey the law law right so uh, i think that jesus is constantly saying i don't need your extra tra traditions to help me obey the law law because the purpose of the law is to bring us into the good life of god and i can see that the good life of god is saving someone from satan is saving someone from illness is picking an ox out of the pit they're all they're all part of the good life of god questions or comments Sabbath given um, as a sign of freedom, that they were no longer slaves in Egypt, that they were given a privilege, really, it's a place of privilege. You think about the people in our own community who are working several jobs to make ends meet. They, don't, they may not have the privilege of taking the yeah. Sabbath day. The good gift of rest is part of, yeah. So Leanne says that, um, you know, this was given as a good gift. You're not slaves anymore. You're allowed to rest. And there is a sense of trust, right? That, um, that 
the man I collected yesterday will be here and God will provide for me today. That um, if I cease to rest or to work for a day, that God will sustain me and my community. And so that, that it, is a, it is a good gift um, that points to the wholeness of a good life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, Jesus went on, okay, he says, you know, he, he rebukes them because they would, they would have pulled their ox out of the pit, but here they don't want to help this man with dropsy, right? Um, and they had nothing to say. And then he goes on to tell a parable that's about what, or a, it's, a, it's more like a teaching story. It's not really a parable exactly um, as we think of it, although it says parable. <laughs> you know, but we think of it as, as like, that's a fiction story and he's giving an instruction here. What's this one about? Don't make, don't make yourself better than you, than you are. Better than others. Okay. So it's all about kind of taking higher or lower places. You go somewhere. Um, and so, you know, are you going to take the high place and risk being moved down? Are you going to take the low place and hope to be moved up? Is Jesus' priority really like working the situation so that you get honored, so that you come out on top? Is that really what Jesus is talking about? It's a cultural thing that puts lost on us. Okay. You know, I mean, typically when we're invited to a wedding, there, there might be the wedding party set aside. It's not a ranking, and yet theirs was a ranking. Yeah, there is a cultural difference here. But, you know, if you were to go and say, well, I feel really close to the bride and groom. I think I'll sit at the wedding party table, you know. I, I, they really, I know it says family, but I think they mean me. I'm practically family, right? And maybe you go, that you get into the embarrassing situation where they're like, excuse me, <laughs> this is for the actual family, you know, right? And so, yeah, there's definitely, we can sort of relate, but this this very structured hierarchy, you know, we have kind of, um, we like to maintain an illusion that we don't have a lot of social hierarchy. Now, we do, right? But sometimes we like to pretend like, no, we're all equals here, right? And so it doesn't, resonate the same way with us but even so do you think jesus is telling them how to work the situation so that they get the most honor from men just encouraging them to be humble, humble. and live humbly okay encouraging them to be humble and live humble okay so this is not a hot tip on how to come out on top right <laughs> this is a reflection of what it means to think of yourself as lowly and how a life lived um, where you're willing to take a lower place how that changes you right this is about living the upside down nature of the kingdom of god we could think of it like a spiritual discipline right a spiritual discipline is something that you can do as a as a habit or a practice that opens you it doesn't fix you. It doesn't display your obedience, right? No, it opens you to the work of the spirit. That's why it's a spiritual discipline. It's a change in your outer that allows God to change you inside, right? And Jesus has been talking about these very things. Don't practice ritual washing as a way to display your um, piety, right instead practice ritual walk don't tithe your mint don't you know practice those things do it as a way to open yourself to the work of god do it as a way to live humble in the kingdom this is about a life that is lived understanding the upside down reality of the kingdom of god chris this is coming from one who washed his own disciples' feet. Yeah, so we Jesus shows them the extent of his love later in the washing of their feet, a humble task, mm -hmm. a humiliating task, right? Mm -hmm. But we see it um, that Jesus lives it, right? He's not out there looking for honor from men for the best places. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Paul's, Paul's words in Philippians where he talks about uh, Jesus said the humble servant that he didn't uh, 
that he, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likely, likeness of men. Yeah. And that, yeah, that the great Christology of Philippians 2, that image of Jesus, didn't consider he his equality with God, which existed, something to be held on to, something to be exploited, something to that he can use for grasping, right? But took on the very nature of a servant. Because that's who that isn't something that is opposite to the nature of God, but he made an exception. That's actually who God is. The servant, the kindness, the lowliness. That's actually the good way to live, the God way to live. Yeah. Let's read the second half of this passage. Um, I'm going to pick up in verse 12. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, okay, so, you know, first it was when you're invited, right? Now it's when you give. Uh, you know, you, he's covering all the bases. Do not invite your friends, your neighbors, or relatives, your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. He makes it sound like that's a bad thing, doesn't he? Right? But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those at the table heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will dine at the feast in the kingdom of God. And Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited. This is the same word for chosen or elected, right? They've been picked, right? They're the ones. Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of ox, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married. I cannot come. And the servant came back and reported this to his master. And then the owner of the house, we've just, we've just seen a parable where there was an owner of the house, right? The owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant says, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. The door may be narrow, but inside the banquet hall is locked. Then the master told his servant, go out into the roads and country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. What do you, what do you see? The roads and the lanes could um, be similar to the nations, the north, south, east, the and The north, west. south, east, and west. Right, we have three groups here in the second parable. The first group is those who were invited first, the chosen. The second group is the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame, and they come in and there's still room and that third group is out into the, the streets, right? And so I think there's a parallel there to the nations, the Gentiles, the bringing in. Yeah, definitely those three groups. What else? There's room for those that will come. There's room for those that will come. Now, the invited, why don't the invited get to, those invited people do not get my banquet. Why don't they get my banquet? They, reject they rejected the banquet. They were invited. It was, the door was open for them, but they rejected it, right? Why did they do that? Why, what, what would, if you had to sum up their excuses, what does it boil down to? Nothing was more it just wasn't that important, was it? It didn't matter enough to give up on their worldly cares. Yeah, so they did not there choose was, to come. There was some security in having been chosen, that it would be always be there or something. There was some, you know, they kind of had, it wasn't an invitation that was, you know, you know that they... 
maybe it's not compelling now because they think the invitation will always be there. They yeah. think, well, I'll just go next time. Yeah. They take it for granted. Okay, that's a great point. Yeah. This is, and. I mean, is that kind of like the first will be last and the last will be first? I mean, yes, it's, does it, <laughs> I think sometimes we feel a little worried that the first will be last and the last will be first because, you know, well, what if I started out first? You know, I have a lot of, of wealth. I've been given so many good gifts by God. Does that mean I'm last? <laughs> okay. How can we be invited to the banquet? We already are. Okay, we already are. How? In what way are we already invited? Because we follow and believe in him, in Jesus. And... What matters in terms of who gets into the banquet? If you're willing, right? Yeah, yeah. Following, yeah. believing, these are different ways to say what yeah. matters is who is willing to come. And who's willing to come? Okay, the poor and the lame, the blind, the less fortunate. The less fortunate. Who are those people? We're all those people. Are we? We're all and those people, are aren't we? I think we're to um, that those choices, those decision points, we have to admit to being the poor, the blind, the lame, to be willing to take the banquet, right? It's the healthy who won't come to the doctor. It's the well-fed who don't come to Jesus, and so they are not satisfied. It's a self-exclusion by deciding I don't need it. I've already got what I need. We have to be willing to say the poor, that's me. Maybe I have a lot of good gifts, but I've got a lot of crippling elements to me and my ability to obey Jesus, you know? And so we have to say, I'm the poor, I'm the blind. I haven't seen I've missed seeing so many times what have I the things I've missed seeing. That's me. I can come to the bank. It's not a them or us. It's not a them or us. It's all of us are either too healthy to accept or willing to accept. Right? How can we follow Jesus' instructions about who to invite? Because that's the first, right? He has two teaching stories. They they're meant to be seen in parallel, I think. And I think with the owner of the house, all three of them, he says, when you give a luncheon or dinner, who do you invite? People who are more, more, more than likely won't invite you at some point. Okay, so you're not trying to choose those who can return the honor, right? So, so how do we do that? and see who doesn't have family. Okay. Who doesn't have a place to go on Thanksgiving or, you know. We look around for those who need. We I go outside your comfort zone. We might have to go outside our comfort zone. We might also have to recognize that those around us that we think are perfectly healthy are just like us. They're also the blind. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it, even if we seem healthy, we know we need Jesus. And if we invite and they're willing to accept, then they were the right person to invite. Right. Like it's the, the invitation can be there. Our communities need to be ones where we invite everyone. We're not chasing after the pretty people. And yet even the pretty people need an invitation. And if they're willing to come, then that gets them in. You're not doing it so they will invite you. You're not doing it for the honor in return. You're not doing it so they're invited. We're communities who are seeking true wholeness, looking for a lowly and recognizing ourselves as lowly. So and it's not transactional. It's not transactional. Okay, that's great. Say more about that. Well, what, what's in it for you? It, it's more of <coughs> calling or for being within the presence of God. 
Okay. Not what's in it for you, but what's in it as a calling for being in the presence of God. Yeah, definitely. You know, the, the peak of this um, passage is right in the center. You know, so we, we always expect the peak to be at the end, but scripture often does that where it puts it in the center, right? Verse 15, blessed. Here's another beatitude. These beatitudes have been key, haven't they? Blessed is the one who will dine at the feast in the kingdom of God. You're blessed to be in if you're willing to come in, right? And that blessing is placed upon them. Thank you all for our discussion today. Excellent. Um, it's been, I've, this, we've had such good discussion in this series. Thank you so much. And um, next week is service day. We're off next week for um, service projects. And then the following week, November 1st on Tuesday, November 2nd on Wednesday, we will do the final table story that's still on the road to Jerusalem, right? Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Um, that passage is Luke 18.31 through 19.27 is the reading for next week. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you, Deanna, for another great lesson. I appreciate you very much. Um, just a reminder that Refresh is Saturday. It's here, y'all. Um, and there's still some sheets in the back where you can register. And let's see, next week on service day, Pam has our Devo and prayer. And Carrie is bringing the cookies. Okay. And we'll have our $3 lunch. And on the back chair back there is a sign-up sheet for the library. If anyone can be in the library, 932, 10, It takes two people to be in there for the kiddos that aren't in class. And then are there prayer requests for Chris before she comes?